Johnny Bench's superstar status is confirmed by baseball people, and Bench comes through in his first World Series swing. There goes the runner. Bench is throw right on the butt. Don't run on him. A one-two pitch. all over the field on defense, trying to catch everything in sight. Oh, that's gone if it's fair. Hit the screen for a home run. He's one of the best ever to play this game. Uh, now, Jaime Sams, I have to tell you this. This is the uh, one of my favorite all-time players. I could talk about his defensive prowess with the one hand, wiping his hand on the dirt at, or at Cincinnati before the pitch came. Him and Seaver are palace. <laughs> Johnny Bench. How are you, Johnny? How are you today? Hi, Chrissy. Okay? Fine, I'm fabulous, man. This is great. I always love being on with you. I thought I had done something oh. wrong. I haven't seen you in a while, but you've been so busy. And congratulations oh. on all. Thank you there, John. Oh, forget that. This is about you now. I right. did Ted Williams sign a ball to you and you're a kid uh, to a future Hall of Famer, Ted Williams? 1969. I went Go with ahead. Roy Seavers. I was in spring training. I went with Roy Seavers because Roy had played with Ted. And I said, is there any chance I could go over and get a ball sign? He said, come on, let's go. I walk in and Mr. And Mr. Williams, Ted, uh, said, uh, uh, "Would you?" I said, would you mind signing a ball? And he said, no. And he signed the ball. And I said, thank you very much. I walked out onto the field as we went back to our clubhouse, and I looked at the ball, and it said to Johnny Bench, a sure Hall of Famer, a Hall of Famer for sure, Ted Williams. And I said, my God, he knows who I am. This is the greatest moment of my life. Ted Williams actually knows who I am and thinks I'm going to be a good ball player. Could anything have been better? 100%. And he was right, I might add. Uh, growing up in Oklahoma, Mickey Mantle, did you love him? Was he your hero growing well, up? As love a him? Let me hear. Come on. There was only one. There was the Mick, man. There was only one, you know, and I was so disappointed when he told, finally told Roger. He said, you go get Ruth. I've got Gary. I'll take the deal. A quick story about uh, Ted Williams. He was on our baseball bunch show, and he we were sitting at dinner, and he said, what makes a curveball curve? And I said, well, you mean the curvature of the earth, the way it rotates? And I immediately changed the subject and walked, walked out of the room. The next morning, I picked him up. And I got in, before he got the door closed to get in the car to go to shoot the, to our episode, he said, what the hell do you mean a curveball curves with a rotation of the earth? I said, you mean the friction of the seams when it hits the day? And he said, you son of a, I stayed up all night thinking you didn't know why a curveball curved. Hey, it's one of my great moments, too. I mean, to have all that good stuff is happening in my life. Oh, my goodness. I had 70 World Series. We'll get to Justy and a homer, and we'll get to uh, the two in a row. The 70 World Series, Brooks hurt you the first couple of games, and, then of course, you had a great game in one of the, the game that you won, but the Orioles had the year before to bother them with the Mets. That was a rough series when you go back and look back, look back at it, Johnny. Give me some thoughts against the Birds in 70, losing in five games. Wayne Simpson was our 12-1 and one at the All-Star break, hurt his arm. Our fifth starter was our number one starter in the World Series. They had 420 game winners. They had Dobson. They had Palmer. They had Cuellar. They had McNally. And it was just everything that everything I hit, everything Tony hit, everything Lee May hit, Brooks was right there at it. So it may have been the early scouting reports that paid off. But Brooks in 1970. One, in the All-Star game, he fielded a ball that I hit like a rocket in Detroit, and I just threw up my hands. I said, am I never going to get rid of you, Brooks? What a wonderful man. What a great series. And unfortunately for us, we played a team that was just absolutely, I think they won 15 or 18 games in a row to finish the season. 420 game winners. Right. And, and uh, one of my favorite players, Elrod Hendricks, was, uh, was catching first part of those games. Oh, uh, sure. Well, left-hand hitter. Who can forget Elrod Hendricks? Uh, 70, listen, the A's were great. They had a little better pitching. You came back from 3-1 down. You got into a game seven in your building, and Oakland won their first championship when they knocked you off in 72. Johnny, that had a sting. Let me hear your thoughts on it, that. Go ahead. It, it was horrible. Hal, Hal McRae pinch hit with the bases loaded. Joe Rudy went up against the wall to catch it. And it turned out to be a sacrifice fly. I can see, still see Hal McRae coming back to the dugout with tears in his eyes. We misjudged the fly ball, and as a result, they win that series. And here we now are 0-2, 1970-1972. We have lost two World Series. Can you imagine what we were thinking when we played the Red Sox? No, we're going to get to that. Fascinating. You had a big game in game one against the Mets. So maybe in game, no, it's game one. When you and Rose hit home runs against Seaver in what was a classic first game in the 73 playoffs at Riverfront, you had a lot of big ones. That was a big one. How about he lost the series, but you and Pete got yourself off to a good start. That was a famous game against Tom Terrific. How about that for a sec? Let me hear. 10th inning. 10th inning. Chris, I let off the 10th inning. 
with the home run against Seaver to win the game. I'll never forget that. Here is his, here's Tom Seaver still pitching in the 10th inning. You think we would have had 14 other pitchers already today's game? We would have had used the whole Trump bullpen, and here's Seaver out there pitching. It's unbelievable. Yeah, Josh, you're crazy. We can go through that a thousand times, 100%. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. You know, I used to have Morgan on all the time. And I remember at one time I had Morgan on in 75, a uh, couple of, four, uh, seven or eight years ago after Texas blew the game six to St. Louis. I said, Joe, you're the best guy they can come up with to have on radio to talk about the mindset of a team losing a sixth game and having to try to win a World Series the next day. Texas couldn't do it, but the Reds in 75 did, and you did it with obviously some past failures, one of the great gut checks of all time, and trailing early in the game against Bill Lee. That's the greatest comeback I've seen in forever. <laughs> Thoughts with that? Go ahead. Well, you know, we had come from behind 57 times, I think, during that season, 37 or 57. Who cares about the stats except you and the guy next to you? But I'm, I'm here we were playing these guys, and then Bill Lee threw that EFAS pitch. And Tony Perez was the best off-speed hitter ever in the game of baseball. And he hit that EFAS pitch, that little looping curveball that he threw to hit that home run, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, to think that, you know, we always want to talk about game six because Carlton hit the home run, but the greatest catch I've ever seen was Dwight Evans in right field catching that ball and turned it into a double play. Here we are having to right. come back, and it wasn't like we were coming back. This was what we did, and this is the way we play. And we, were, we thought we were still the best. And we turned out and we proved it. And then against the Yankees, you were dominant. I'm sure, you know, I know Munson got upset, Yankee fans, because Sparky said, don't compare anybody to, to Johnny Bench. You now, listen, you know, Thurman was a great player in his own right, but there was only one JB, and that is you. And you dominated the Yankees in that series, four straight. That had to feel pretty good. Go ahead. We, I remember Sparky coming out to the mound to change pitchers after uh, Munson had got another base hit. I think he got eight or nine hits and everything else, hit 500 and something. And this is Ed Figueroa. This is a little fastball inside that's got down there and just happened to hit the screen. And this is Dick Tidrow. And this is Roy White trying to climb the wall. And he goes into the first row. And Sparky said at that time, he turned to George Sugar, we call Sugar Bear. And he said, Sugar, I think we're going to be world cha champs again. And man, was that the best ever. Oh, phenomenal. Uh, you know, you and Seaver, um, the, the, the two of you, I mean, how much fun was it? I mean, two tremendous craftsmen. He one of the great craftsmen making sure there's dirt on his kneecap. And the great Johnny Bench, number five, with the one-handed glove and wiping your hand on the sand. Who would love that at Old Riverfront? But what a thrill to see. There you go. How about you two there working together? Obviously, the no-hitter as well. But how about the first time you caught Tom Seaver in Riverfront? Thoughts on that? Well, the first time was in uh, Montreal, and I was giving him all kinds of guff because I said, oh, the great Tom Seaver, now we're going to win our pennant. And now we're going to win our pennant. And he would just look at me and glare at me because we worked crossword puzzles and he worked the North, New York Times crossword puzzle. We played bridge. We were bridge partners. And he was just the best. And in the second inning, he gave up like a double, a single, a single, a double. They had two runs. You know, we scored a run in the first. And I said, there you go, Tom. That's all the runs you need. Let's go. We've got to win here. Then he gives up these two runs, and he still has two runners on. And I go out to the mound, and I said, are you trying? And he looked at me, and he just like, <laughs> and he always tells the story more than I do, that, you know, he said it, and he smumbled to himself, if we get three runs, we'll win this game. So now he gets out of the inning. And in the fifth inning, there's nobody on, and there's two outs. And I call time, and I walk out to the mound. And he's looking at me like, why in the hell are you coming out here? There's nobody on. There's two two outs. I'm pitching good. And I and I got up to the mound and I said, should all should I throw the ball back to you hard or softly? And just turned around and immediately walked back to the plate. And he screamed at me, don't you ever come out here and talk to me again like that. What a professional. What a man's man. I was blessed. I think any and if you watch Tom when he goes to other teams, whether it be the White Sox, the Reds, anybody else, had the same respect for that man. He was the best. Well, I'm old enough to see it, so I can say it. That's the best battery that I've ever seen in the history of Major League Baseball. Seaver to bench. That's I can't cool. say any better than that. That's the best battery I've ever seen. You know, you were the last red standing. Perez leaves. Rose goes free agency. Morgan bounces around. Seaver leaves, too. You were the last great red standing. A little depressing if you're looking at it that way, but you are Cincinnati, Johnny. How about that? Go ahead. Well, I had a lot of things going. I was working for a bank. I was a spokesman for the bank. I was going to do TV. I still had my TV shows. 
And I was doing a lot of work and everything else. I had a nice contract, but I had two more years on it. And I said, I'm not earning the money. I wasn't playing like Johnny Bench. I mean, and, you know, I think you you got to earn your money. And I and I said, I'm, I'm retiring. I just, I walked away from uh, what was going to be a $900,000 or $800,000 contract. And uh, I said, you know, I'm not earning the money and we're not going anywhere. I've got my life to live. I want to be able to walk uh, when I'm 50. I don't want to be crippled by doing that. That's why I gave up catching. But, uh, you know, life turned out so great. My boys are terrific. I've got a great life going and, and uh, my soccer games. I'm understanding that a little bit now. So my life is great, Chris. I, I couldn't be happier. I could get, get a little AFib, but, you know, that stuff, uh, I guess you got to live with it. I'm just keeping the old man out. Yeah, you know, uh, Johnny Bench, the name is the great. Sometimes it's names. Johnny Bench, uh, not a better name in baseball uh, <laughs> than that. I, and I, said, I love that. You know, you also did a lot of games on radio with the World Series with Vin Scully. So you saw Vin, and, you know, Vin, you know, loved to paint the word picture, and you had to find your way in there as his analyst with the Radio World Series games. Johnny, let me hear your thoughts on that. Go ahead. <laughs> I swear Vin had already seen the game was doing a replay. I mean, that's how that's how good he was. I mean, there was just – but he always had this thing. You know, he's so used to working alone that he would ask me a question as the pitcher was winding up. Well, I didn't have time to answer, and you never – you know, in radio, you've got to call every pitch, the wind up and now the pitch. Here it is, low and outside. But, it, you know, it was like, how could I catch up with this? And it was just, it was a marvel to see them. You know, I worked with Harry. I worked with Jack Buck. I worked with the great ones. Had Jerry Coleman was so much fun. And CBS Radio was just great to me. And Norman, Norman Bear was the producer. I mentioned my man. Because all of it was just so much fun to do and so much enjoyment. And I, I, I still had Bobby at that time, my young, my now 33 year old. And so I could only do half the season, but I did the, did the broadcast on the world series and did all-star games. And, and uh, I just, it was great just to still be around the game to see the young players and see them develop and have a former relationship. And so I've, uh, I really did cement that. I don't know so much about them now. I mean, the young kids and everything else are such a turnover, but uh, I'm still the one watching every, Every box score, I can tell you almost everything that goes on. Just I watch the box scores and and try to keep up with what you're doing and who's trading and who's not trading and who's not worth a damn and who's going to be okay. And I, I still don't understand it, but I was uh, I got to have breakfast with Paul Goldschmidt the other day, which is cool because he's a great guy oh, and really? all the stuff that go. Oh wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Name dropping uh, you on you, Chris. Right. Now I've impressed you. Yeah, yeah I love it. I want to give you. I want to give you one here as we ended. That's interesting because I used to talk to Rose about this. Wasn't White Hoyt the uh, red announcer there when you came up there in the late '60s? So you could talk Babe Ruth. Is that true or not true? Absolutely true. And I spent a lot of times there. And the owners had to wait over wherever we went. Wait was there, and what a storyteller. And I have a letter, handwritten letter, uh, from Wait that I still have to this day. When I was uh, not doing as well, and some of the boo birds were out. And, the, and he said, don't let them get you down. He it was, a, it was a whole full letter, handwritten, and it's one of my special treasures that I have. And, and wait was, and he loved to laugh. He would, he would just, you know, he would chortle. He would like, it would be like he would tell a story and he'd start laughing at his own story because he knew the ending already. But what a classy man, what a blessing I was. And then, of course, we had the great announcers and, and Joe Nuxall with the, one of our favorite guys and everything else. And uh, of course, then Lee, Al Michaels was there and then Marty came along. And so uh, broadcasting has always been a part of my life. And I worked with Tommy Brenneman. I hope he gets back on the air. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a great life. Gosh, I'm still doing it, man. You've had a, you've had a storybook life, and you had some you know con you had some trap with the cancer and the lung and all that. You've had other things too. It hasn't been all glory, and you've hung in there pretty good. But think about it for a second, folks. Johnny Bench caught Tom Seaver, broadcast with Vin Scully, still fresh as a daisy, and hung out with Wade Hoyt, who was on the twenty seven Yankees. I mean, you can't you can't have a better baseball life than that. That's as good as it gets, John. Good as it gets. Well, if you say it is, I believe it because it was. And now that you say it like that, that is kind of a blessing, isn't it? It sure is. You're the best. We'll talk soon. Knock in bed and stay healthy. Appreciate you coming on here today, as usual. Anytime, my friend. Thank you. You got it, Johnny Bench, the great Johnny Bench, number five of the Reds. Good to have uh, you with us. Texas Ranger discussion. Come on back, Kai. Don't go away.